You know, it's interesting. Um, when you're laying in your bed because of COVID and your head is stuffed and your ears are plugged, which actually works really well for kids, you know, just, just teasing. But, but your ear, my, my kids are great. Um, but your ears are plugged. You know, one of the things that you think about is... You know, unfortunately, there were people that lost their lives because of this crazy virus. And uh, it makes you think, why am I so fortunate? Like, why am I one of the ones that was able to, so, no, not, not that I wanted to die. <laughs> I want to make that really clear. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, but it does make you wonder, like, like why, why am I? Why am I one of the ones? Um, and I really do think that it goes in line with what it is that we're going to be talking about today as we wrap up this series called Made Brand New. And I really do hope that you're able to take this and really plug this into your life uh, as, as we look at what we feel like God is calling us to do. You know, we made it really clear that, that the goal of this series is that you will be able to get to a point where your damage no longer has a say-so in your life. That your damage no longer hinders you from being able to, to live the kind of life that God has created and called you to be able to live. That you would be able to say no more to your damage because you were able to begin to see yourself through the lens by which God sees you. And, and so, really, as we wrap up the series, here's the one question that I wanted to ask. And I really want us to wrestle with this. And it's simply this. Why does God rescue us from our damage? I mean, really. Why does God rescue us from our damage? And, and I really want you to take a moment to just think about that. And as you're thinking about it, here's what I wanted to do is, is I just want to go through and just hit the highlights of this series so far. Okay, so this series launched on Easter Sunday. Doesn't that already seem like that was so long ago? It's like, it feels like it was eons and decades ago. Um, but that was just six, Sunday, six weeks ago. It's crazy. But we launched on that Sunday. And we asked this one simple question. Does God truly love me? Does he truly love me? And, and here's one of the conclusions that we came to. At, and that was the main theme for the message. It was simply this. Is that love sees beneath, sees the beauty beneath the brokenness. And love sees the beauty beneath the brokenness. And so we were able to recognize the way that God sees us, which moved us into the next week as we begin to delve in, well, well, how does God see us? And we begin to look at the fact that you are made in God's image, that you are made in God's image. And so as a result, the main theme for that Sunday was simply this, is what you refuse to face, confront, or admit will define and limit you. And so then what we did the following Sunday is we jumped into our story. Because one of the things I love about Scripture is those moments when you're able to find the story of someone that we can look at and begin to dig into. And we looked, and we've been walking into the life of this guy named Mephibosheth. Now, before this series started, some of you have never heard of that guy. And now you're thinking, I'm so glad this series is ending because I'm tired of hearing about that guy. But I'm, I'm hoping, again, as we look at his life and we look at his damage, that maybe God has spoken through you. And so one of the things that we did for fun is, when I, one of the things I like to do is when I read the scriptures, is sometimes I like to try to put faces with the different people just to make it fun. And so in looking at the story of Mephibosheth, Mephibosheth had this grandfather named Saul. And so we said Saul was, was this guy here, Samuel Jackson. We said that that's Saul. He looks like a Saul, doesn't he? He looks like an angry, he's an angry person. He's angry, so angry. Um, but what happened with Saul is Saul started out like he had the anointing of God with him, and then he began to make some decisions, and he actually became like this angry, disenchanted guy. And then we know that Saul had a son named Jonathan, and so we said that this is Jonathan. So my wife, you know, my wife is on a trip this weekend, and so she's actually coming back tonight, and so she's missed her last chance to see Idris, and so now she's just, she's stuck with me. Um, but, but we said that that would be the idea of Jonathan, that, that that was Saul's son named Jonathan. 
And Jonathan was really a supportive son, but Jonathan also recognized that there was something wrong with his dad. There was a disconnect with his dad. Now, Jonathan had a best friend, and we said that this is Jonathan's best friend, that guy there. Um, and, and so with that, they had this connection. And in that connection, one of the things that they did is, is Jonathan knew that there was something unique about David. And he knew that if things were to happen, that David was going to be the next one in line. And so he said to David, and they made a pact with one another, that if anything were to happen to my father or me, that David, you would take care of my family. And David said, yes, he would do that. And so now we fast forward to now David is king, and David decides to fulfill his promise. So he goes to a guy named Ziba, who was the servant of Saul, and he says, is there anyone left with, of Jonathan's family that I could show kindness to? And Ziba says, yes, there's this guy named Mephibosheth. So we have Mephibosheth there, Professor X. Uh, but there's this guy named Mephibosheth, and the problem with Mephibosheth is that he's crippled. And that's how he actually introduces him. Yeah, there's one left, but he's crippled. That's how he introduces Mephibosheth. And we find out from Mephibosheth's story that, that when Saul, his grandfather, and Jonathan, his, his father had died in battle, uh, there was this concern about what was going to happen to the family. And so they decided to evacuate. And while they were evacuating, the nanny was running with Mephibosheth. She trips and falls, and he is crippled from that point forward. And remember what we said a, over the course of this series is we don't believe that his crippling was just a physical one. We think his crippling was also an emotional, a, a one of, of his identity. And, and so with that, as we looked at that series and we began to talk about how important, like if you really want to begin to overcome the voice of your damage, uh, one of the things that I love this is Mephibosheth said, why would you show this kindness to me, a dead dog like me? And David doesn't respond to that. David just says, eat at my table. Come eat at my table. And we talked about if you want to quiet the damage of your, uh, the voice of your damage, is to spend time eating at God's table. And so here's what we said that week. We said that your life is defined by what you see and how you see it. That your life is defined by what you see and how you see it. And so we challenged you to make a commitment to look at your life differently. And then, and then here's the other thing that we recognize, and we spent our last two weeks talking about this, is we found that when you decide to live for God, when you decide to change your life, when you decide to get your act together, when you decide that I'm looking at this path that I'm on and I want to change the path that I'm on to live a better path, when you decide to do that, then that opens up all kinds of attacks by the enemy. But not only that, it opens up all kinds of attacks in life. It's amazing. You decide to eat right and all of a sudden like carrot cake just shows up on your plate. I don't know how that happens. It's just, it's magic. It's just magic. But it just seems that way, doesn't it? You decide to do something better, then all of a sudden, there is always this sense of, of, of challenge. There's always this sense of an enemy that is against you, that's trying to hold you back. And, and so we saw that this was, this was the experience that Mephibosheth had. He's now eating at the table of the king, but there's this person that's really trying to hold him back. But we said this. We said that the pain that made you no longer has a right to define you. That's what we talked about that week. The pain that made you no longer has a right to define you. So it's important for us to begin to understand that. And then as we begin to look at this aspect of, of, of dealing with an enemy, we introduced a new character. And that character is, uh, is Peter, Peter Pettigrew. <coughs> and if you're familiar with Peter Pettigrew, uh, for those of you that have read the Harry Potter series, uh, Peter Pettigrew was a friend of Harry's mom and dad. And they had a, they had a group of people that were all friends together, and Peter Pettigrew, he, he betrayed them all, and it's because of him that, his, that Harry's mother and, and dad got killed. It's because of this guy. He betrayed everyone. And so we, we, we looked at Ziba, and we said Peter Pettigrew is Ziba, because what Ziba does is Ziba becomes, begins to manipulate and, and trick and scheme. And, and we, we, we talked about the fact that I believe that Ziba saw himself as better than Mephibosheth, because that was kind of the mindset back then. If you were someone who was physically challenged, people looked at you as less than human. And, and I believe that when he said to, to David, yeah, there's, there's this one that's left, but, he, but he's, he's crippled. He's crippled. I believe that he thought David would go, oh, he's crippled? Well, fine. You know what, Ziba, I give it to you. I think that's what he thought would happen. But David blew his mind because David was able to look beyond Mephibosheth's damage and still see his value. But Ziba began to scheme and manipulate and trick. And the result of that is then... Ziba found, or Mephibosheth found this place where David made this declaration. 
And the truth is the declaration is unfair. It's unfair. So Ziba schemes and manipulates, and so David says to Ziba, you know what, you can have all of Mephibosheth's stuff, because he made it look like Mephibosheth turned against him. You can have all of his stuff. And then David runs into Mephibosheth, and Mephibosheth paints the picture of the truth, and then David says, well, okay, okay, here's the deal. Uh, you can have half of it, Ziba, and you can have half of it, Mephibosheth. Is that unfair? Let me lie, cheat, and scheme, and I get half your stuff. We're going to end up on Judge Judy or something, right? Because it's just not, it's not fair. And then the response that Mephibosheth had, we'll talk about that in a moment, but that week we said this, we said the breadth and depth of our healing is directly correlated to the level of our surrender. It's directly correlated to the level of our surrender. And so Mephibosheth looks at all of this, and Mephibosheth says, he says, look, don't just give him half of it, give him all of it. As long as I have you, as long as I have you, David, I don't care about the rest of the stuff. And, and so what we did last week is we reverse engineered how Mephibosheth arrived. And in that, we saw that, that he, he started with trust. And then we also saw that he had gratitude. And that all worked together to change his perspective. And when we have the right trust, gratitude, and perspective, then what happens is that begins to change our actions and the way that we interact with God and the way that we interact with life. And we begin to grow and we begin to change. And then all of a sudden, we begin to recognize that all this stuff that I tried to define myself by, by being damaged, to try to make me feel less damaged, make me feel more whole, all of those things, it doesn't matter. As long as I'm continuing to spend time at the king's table, connecting with him, building intimacy with him, building a relationship with him, he is the one that loves me. He is the one that accepts me. He is the one that fills me. He is the one that builds me. I don't need all this stuff, Jesus, as long as I have you. And the question that we wrestled with was simply this, is Jesus more than enough? And so now we're going to wrap up this series, and I want to introduce a final character, one that you may not have seen coming in this story, but it is one that's, that's vitally important for us to talk about. And the final character that I want to introduce is you. Is you. And how important your story is. We talked about why does God heal us from our damage? Why does he rescue us from our damage? And here's the main reason why. is because God's story is told through your story. God's story is told through your story. Through your story. Why? So what we're going to do is we're going to look at why does God heal us from our damage. And I figure the best place, the best place to start is we've been looking at damaged people, right? And wouldn't it be great to look at an example of, of damaged people and how the result of it is completely opposite of what we would expect? And so why not start with the genealogy of Jesus Christ? I mean, think about this. Like, as a man, if a man or a woman, a human being, were to write Jesus' story, and they were to write the story of his ancestral heritage, what do you think it would look like? Everybody would be perfect, right? Good manners, use napkins at the table. <laughs> this is what everybody would be. Like, you would look at everybody, everybody would be like right in line, because that's what you would expect his ancestral heritage would be. But when you go back and you look at it, what you realize is Jesus came from damaged people. And literally what that proves to us is damage does not have the final say-so. It says this in, in Matthew chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac was the father of Jacob. Jacob was the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez was the father of Hezron, and Hezron was the father of Ram. So now let's go back and let's look at his genealogy a little bit. Talk about people that are broken. See, we look at Abraham, we think the father of our faith, because that's what he's called, and rightfully so. But do you know that the father of our faith was traveling with his wife, and they went to, the, went to Egypt, and he, he was like, um, honey, I, I think you're too beautiful, and the people here are going to kill me. They're going to kill me so that they can have you. So why don't you just tell everybody, you're my sister. And so Pharaoh sees Abraham's wife, and he's like, huh, hey. And then he realizes 
that is actually Abraham's wife. He's like, dude, why did you do this to me? And the truth was, Abraham was so insecure. And then later on, we're talking about the father of faith, later on, as we look at the story of, of God giving Abraham the promise to the time that the promise is, from the time that the promise is given to the time that the promise is fulfilled, Abraham had his doubts. He wasn't sure how it was going to work out. He even tried to do things his own way and messed everything up. That's the father of faith. And then he had the son Isaac. And you know what? Isaac followed his father's example. He went to this place, thought, hey, you know what, honey? You're too beautiful. So we're going to tell everyone that you're my sister. And then what happens is the person that's attracted to Isaac's wife happens to see Isaac and his sister. And he's like, that's a little freaky deaky. And then he realizes that's not his sister. That's his wife. That's his wife that he's acting that way with. And so he's like, dude, why would you do this to me? Why would you do this to me? And the reason why is because he's driven by fear. And then we find out later on that Isaac is such a stand-up dad, such an incredible stand-up dad, that he has favorites among his sons. And one of his sons is such a favorite that his other sons get together and say, hey, let's kill him. That's how bad the favoritism was. Let's kill him. And then one of the sons kind of had a guilty conscience and said, let's not kill him. Let's sell him off into slavery. <laughs> That's still bad. Let's sell him off into slavery. And then, let's go back and tell dad he was killed. Let's go back and tell This is that family. This is the family. And then one of Isaac's sons, named Judah. Judah has a son that marries a girl named Tamar. That son dies. And so they had a law back then that if your son was married to a woman, and if your son dies, then you would give that woman to the next son for him to be married to. So Judah does that. And then that son dies. And then that son dies. And all of a sudden, Judah recognizes there's a pattern here. And so rather than following the law, Judah says, uh-uh, uh-uh. So then what she does is she disguises herself, and then she seduces Judah, and then she gets pregnant. She gets pregnant. And then Judah finds out that she's pregnant and is like, what? She's pregnant? Kill her. And she says, well, before you kill me, let me show you the cane of the man who impregnated me. And so he shows, she shows him the cane, and he's like, uh-oh. <laughs> That's my cane. So this is, this is the lineage of Jesus. We have all of these people who were damaged. And here's the thing that I want you to understand. Why does God rescue you from your damage? Is because he wants you to understand that your damage does not have to affect your legacy. That good can still come out of your damage. You can still turn your life around. And incredible can still come out of it. That again, that your damage does not have to have the final say. Because again, God's story is told through your story. God's story is told through your story. Then what happens is David, one of, again, part of the, the ancestral history of Jesus, you know, David being his great, 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 great grandfather, and it was actually more than that, but I'm just tired of saying the word great. But that was his, so what happens, David sees this woman, she's bathing on a tower, and uh, hey, and he ends up having an affair with this woman. And many of us are familiar with the story of David and Bathsheba, but he has an affair with this woman. Then he tries to cover it up. That doesn't work out. So he kills her husband and then makes it look like he's the good guy by coming in because she got pregnant from their, from their liaison. And then what happens is David is confronted. He's confronted. And so once he's confronted, he begins to talk to God about it. And he writes a song about it. And that song is referred to as Psalm 51. And, and here's what he says in Psalm chapter 51, verses 12 and 13. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. Then I will teach your way to rebels and they will return to you. What is another reason why God rescues us from our damage? He rescues us from our damage because once we begin to understand who he is and the way that he works, it also puts us on the path to begin to find purpose. 
And so David recognizes, look, here's what I'm going to do. is God, you forgive me. You forgive me. So from this point on, I'm going to make it a goal of my life that every person that I come across who's now a rebel against you, I will tell them about you. I will tell them about your love, and I will lead them back to you. That becomes his purpose from that point forward. That's what he decides to do. So from your damage can come your purpose. So that's another reason why God rescues you from your damage. So again, your damage does not have to affect your legacy, and also in your damage, you can find purpose and begin to invest and change lives of those who are around you. This week, I don't know, uh, there's a show on Netflix. Uh, it's, it's David Letterman. He has, a, he has a talk show on Netflix, but what's really cool is the entire show is dedicated to one person. And so really, it's a deep dive conversation that he has with that person. And the person that he had on the week that I, the week that I was watching was Malala. And for those of you that may be unf unfamiliar with Malala, uh, she's a girl that was born in Pakistan. She really began to push for education for girls. And in doing so, she's very clear that it was a problem of the Taliban. So then the Taliban marked her, decided to kill her. A boy, uh, a boy boards her bus, shoots her in the head, and she survives. And she survives. And here's what she said. She said, as a result of that, I realized that I have a purpose. And she said, I'm going to push women, education for women that much more. And I began to watch and I began to think, okay, now what, what about us? What about us who have been delivered from our damage? Whether it's physical, emotional, mental, spiritual, whatever kind of damage it is. How much more so should we begin to recognize that I have been given purpose by Jesus and begin to step out and say, you know what, I'm going to do everything that I can to fulfill that and make a difference in my life because of the fact that he has rescued me from my damage. Here's another reason why God heals us of our damage. There's a story of this, this man who is demon-possessed, and it says that what he would do is he would roam the hills of the countryside as well as he would roam through the, through the graveyards. And I, I wonder, like, well, ah, like, what did that sound like when you would see this guy coming? And they said that what they would do is they would try to bound this guy and what he would do is he would break the chains and he would break the shackles. So they could not control this guy. He was completely uncontrollable. So then Jesus happens to come, runs into the guy, and begins to have a conversation with the demons that are in this guy. And then Jesus asks the demons, like, what's your name? And the demons say, we are legion, for we are many. We are many. So not only is this guy damaged, it's not just by one demon, not just one I mean, we've seen scary movies. One demon seems to be enough. But this guy is inhabited by multiple demons. So they know Jesus is about to cast them out. So they said, Jesus, when you cast us out, cast us out into those pigs. And so they do. Jesus does. He casts them out. He casts them out into the pigs. And it says 2,000 pigs jumped to their death that day. 2,000. See, that's why you should be a vegetarian. Because pigs are filled with demons. Except for bacon. Bacon is sanctified by God. But yeah, I mean, you, you look at this. And it is, so you look at this, and so 2,000, so that's how many demons was in this guy. That's how damaged this guy was. That's how damaged he was. And then all of a sudden, people from the town, they walk up, and they see Jesus standing. And this guy is sitting in front of Jesus, clothed, in control. You, it's obvious that he's been rescued. And the town hears a story about the pigs. They hear the story about Jesus. And for some reason, the town freaks out. And they're like, Jesus, we want you to go. Bye-bye. We want you to go. And so Jesus gets in a boat. And then this conversation happens. It says in Mark chapter 5, verses 18 through 20, as Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. But Jesus said, no, go, to your, go home to your family and tell them everything the Lord has done for you and how merciful he has been. So the man started off to visit the ten towns of that region and began to proclaim the great things Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed at what he told them. Everyone was amazed. So again, your story matters. What is another reason? Why God rescues you, rescues you from your damage is because he wants you to tell your story. 
of how you've been rescued, of how your life has been changed, how your life is different, how you're moving forward, how you're progressing. And again, maybe you haven't arrived yet, because the truth is, none of us have. I have not arrived yet. None of us have. But I can tell you now, because of Jesus, we're different than what we were before. Because of Jesus, we're less driven by our damage than we were before. See, there's a reason, again, why God allows us to be saved and then we don't go to heaven immediately. It's because God wants us here to tell our story. He wants you to tell your story. How your life was damaged. How he turned it around. How he began to invest in you. How you begin to spend time at the, the king's table. And you begin to spend time in scripture. And you begin to recognize what God says about you. And you begin to pray. And you begin to recognize that prayer is not a way for me to manipulate God and try to get God to do what I want to do. Prayer is a way that now I am connected with the, with the, with the creator of the universe. And I'm able to share my, my, share my heart with him. And he's able to share his heart with me. And it's a connection. And he welcomes me. He welcomes me to come before him. He welcomes me, brokenness at all, to just come before him. So I spend time at the king's table. And it has changed me. It has changed the way that I see myself. People need to hear that. They need to hear your story. And, and I do wonder, like, the thing that this world is crying out right now for is answers. And your story is vitally important to begin to communicate those answers. You know the one question that people are really asking? If you sit down and you begin to talk to people about Jesus, you know what they're asking? Does Christianity really work? Does it really work? Well, if you can begin to tell the story of your damage and how you've been able to progress and grow and develop and change, then you can begin to show that the answer to that question is yes. It does work. It does work. Look at my life. Look at where I am. Look at where I'm moving. And again, be honest. I'm still not perfect. I still make mistakes. I still falter. But man, I've grown so much because of Jesus. And I know it's because of Jesus. Because I tried it on my own before. I tried it on my own before and I failed. I blew it. I made mistakes. I kept making the same mistakes over and over again. It wasn't until Jesus came in that I began to learn how to be able to change and grow and to develop. And it was a work in progress. But I saw how patient Jesus was with me. I saw how Jesus never gave up on me. How even when I would blow it, he would continue to accept me. Yes, he would challenge me. Yes, he would push me. Yes, because he cared for me. He did not want me to stay the same as I was. So even there may be times where Jesus disciplined me because of what it is that I was doing. But his goal was for me to recognize his heart, his compassion, his mercy, his love for him, and his love for me. So I can tell you, my life is so different now. People need to hear your story. They need to hear how your life is different, how your life is growing how your life is changing. So I want to challenge you with that. Who are you intentionally connecting with? Not, not just accidentally. Who are you intentionally making a commitment? Like, God, I'm going to make myself available. And maybe, maybe there's a place that you could serve. Maybe there's a place that you have a heart to serve. Maybe there are people that you have a heart about or a heart for. But, but again, who is it? Who is it that God has wired you to begin to invest your life in? So that they can hear your story and be motivated by your story. And to begin, also begin to believe in Jesus because of your story. And if Jesus can do that for you, then maybe, just maybe, Jesus can do that for me. That's what people need to hear today. They need to hear about the goodness of God. Because here's another reason why Jesus rescues you from your damage. Because here's the truth. Who better to relate to someone who's a damaged person than someone who's been through the same damage? Who better? Who better? I could never talk to an alcoholic about Jesus. I mean, I could, but it would never be the same as if someone else who was delivered by alcoholism talked to that person about Jesus. So different. Now, I tell you what I can do. I could talk to someone who was sexually abused as a kid and begin to tell them how Jesus changed the way that I saw me. I can relate to that. I can relate to their struggle and sharing their story about it. Because I was been there. I walked through their shoes. And so Jesus wants us. Who better to relate to someone who's damaged than someone who has been damaged? And I don't know. I don't know what your damage is. Sometimes we look at our damage 
And we look at somebody else and like, ooh, <laughs> they're really messed up. <laughs> ooh, I can see why God would use them. But then we look at our own damage and we think, you know what, I really haven't been through much. I don't know. Here's the point, though. It doesn't matter the level of your damage. Everybody, and here's the truth, everyone, every single human being is damaged on some level. They all are. We all are. So tell your story. Because you never know. You never know who it may touch. And again, who better to relate to damaged people than someone who's been damaged? So Jesus shows up into this town. And he shows up, and you guys, are, many of you are familiar with the story. He shows up at this well, and there's this woman that's there, and she's trying to avoid everyone. And they begin to have a conversation. And Jesus begins to lay out her damage. He begins to lay out her struggle. And her mind's blown because of it. But she also begins to see this, there's something different about Jesus. And so it says in John chapter 4, verses 28 through 30, the woman left her water jar beside the well and ran back to the village telling everyone, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. You know what she's saying? Come see the man who told me about my damage. He revealed my damage to me. Now think about this. Here was a woman who went to a well because she was trying, at the time that she went, in the height of the morning or afternoon, because she was trying to avoid people, and now she's running into the town. Into the t- she was trying to avoid people because she was so damaged. Now she runs into the town, and she's leading with her damage. She's leading with her damage and saying, look, This guy told me how damaged I was. Could he be the Messiah? Could he possibly be the Messiah? And it shows us how damaged she was because the hotel went, oh, let's go meet this guy. And so the whole town goes to meet Jesus. And it says in verses 39 through 42, many of the Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the woman said, He told me everything I ever did. He exposed my damage. When they came out to see him, they begged him to stay in their village. So he stayed for two days, long enough for many more to hear his message and believe. Then they said to the woman, now we believe, not just because of what you told us, but because of what we have heard ourselves. We have hurt ourselves. And I wonder, I wonder how many people that were there that they have their damage exposed. But finally, it says, now we know that he is indeed the savior of the world. Now we know. I have had my damage exposed. And I let with my damage. Because in my damage, it shows his greatness. And again, when I leave by my damage, and there are people who have familiarities with my damage because they struggle with the same damage, and they begin to look, because people who are damaged, they're looking for hope. They're looking for possibilities. They, they've tried to fix themselves. They've tried to overcome themselves. And they still find themselves struggling in the same way. Or, or maybe they find something that they think works, and it works temporarily, but then it's taken away from them. And that's what happened with COVID. All those things that people turned to were all of a sudden gone that made them feel less damaged, it was gone. Friends, gone. Money, gone. Job, gone. Identity, gone. It was gone. And so now they find themselves, now their damage is exposed once again. This world has never been more open to hope than it is right now. Than it is right now. Now, they may not know that they need hope, because most people who need hope don't know they need it, right? They may not know it. But they begin to hear your story, and it tickles their ears. Because again, they begin to see you, or themselves, in you. And they want, again, what it is that you have as you tell your story. Because again, God's story is told through your story. It is told through your story. And so there's an encouragement that we're given. It says in Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16, You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. 
In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. People need to see your light. They need to see your light. And, and here's what my hope is. My hope for you is that from this point forward, that you will say to your damage, you no longer have a right to dictate my life. You no longer have a right to affect my legacy. You no longer, no longer have a right to silence my voice. You no longer have a right to dictate my relationship with God. You no longer have a right. It is time for us to take back the land that we have surrendered because of our damage. It's time for us to take it back. But then not only that, it's time for us to spread the light. It's time for us to be the light. So we're going to do something today as we wrap up this series. And I really want to invite you to do this. Every one of you. Hold on.